Good evening. My name is Sarah Peterson, and I have the honor of serving as the Washington State Refugee Coordinator, and I oversee the Washington Office of Refugee and Immigrant Assistance at the Department of Social and Health Services. We are very excited to be joined tonight by our partner, uh, Katrina Boratko at Airbnb.org to talk to all of you about how to become a host for Afghan refugees. The DSHS Office of Refugee and Immigrant Assistance is the office within Washington state government that helps to coordinate public and private resources to resettle refugees in Washington state. As many of you know, Washington has a long history of welcoming refugees to our communities. Since 1975, more than 140,000 people have uh, joined our local communities from over 70 different countries. And in the past 10 years, more than 4,000 people have arrived from Afghanistan which has led to our strong Afghan-American community. Tonight, we're joined by Anila Afsali, who is a partner with the Department of Social and Health Services through the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, American Muslim Empowerment Network. I'd like to give Anila a few moments to just greet all of you uh, and to say any additional announcements that she would like to make. Anila, are you able to unmute? I sure am. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Katrina and Airbnb and, of course, our partners at DSHS for this work uh, and especially to the strong interest we have seen from the wider community. We so appreciate the community at large stepping up and wanting to welcome and help uh, our, with our incoming Afghan uh, community. It has really meant so much. I will say this personally as an Afghan American. It has meant the world to me at a time of such crisis and challenge and turmoil to see the community step up and so many amazing folks like all of you who have joined us for this call today uh, to really step up and want to welcome your homes to our incoming Afghan neighbors. So we're excited to host this program together and talk about specific ways that we can address uh, the, the housing needs uh, specifically through Airbnb and the home hosting. And we look forward to answering questions that you have. You can definitely use the Q&A feature uh, as well as the chat. And I know that Katrina has already gotten a head start with some of the responses, uh, but we look forward to answering questions and then following up and really doing this work together because this is a time where we really need all hands on deck. Uh, there's so much work that we're doing with the different work groups that we've established with DSHS and MAPS AMEN, and there's so many different needs. And I just want to personally and on behalf of the community, uh, thank all all of you for participating in this and doing your part to really help our neighbors and make Washington the kind of model state uh, for the rest of the country. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anila. We really appreciate uh, that information. Just a few housekeeping uh, uh, items. We have opened up the question and answer. Uh, feature on this Zoom meeting. And we invite all of you to, um, to use that section to, uh, to, um, to answer any, to ask any questions and to answer and to receive your questions. We will also be opening the question and answer feature on the chat once it's time for questions and answers towards the end of the presentation tonight. Tonight, we're going to hear from Katrina at airbnb.org. We've also invited a representative to speak from the Afghan Health Initiative about uh, specific uh, cultural sensitivities that we should all be aware of. And we have invited uh, a, host, a current host through Airbnb that can share a little bit about their experience as well. Today's session will be featured on our DSHS website site, and we will post that in the chat for all of you to, uh, to follow as well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Katrina for um, your uh, presentation and for to go ahead and get started in answering everybody's questions. Awesome, thanks Sarah. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, we can, Katrina. 
Cool. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks to all of you for having me and for everyone for uh, coming tonight. Um, my name is Katrina. I'm calling in from Oakland, California, and I'm a community manager on the Airbnb.org team. Um, and I've been with Airbnb.org for a little over three years now. Um, so I work specifically with our, our hosts. Um, and so I'm really excited to answer any questions around hosting that y'all have tonight. Um, and I'm just really excited to be here today. Um, you know, before, before the pandemic, I was able to do a lot of traveling and meeting with folks in person. So this is kind of the next best thing, but can't wait to do more of that again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you all see this presentation? Cool. We are seeing the presentation, but it is in the full, there you go, excellent. Cool. Thanks. All right, um, so here's um, a quick agenda that I have for this evening. Um, whoop, I have a really touchy mouse, so that might happen a couple of times, apologies. Um, I'm gonna kick it off by giving y'all some background on the history of Airbnb social impact work, um, which includes a program called Open Homes, which has now evolved into Airbnb.org. Um, then I'll give a quick overview of who we are at Airbnb.org um, and a little bit of a background on our global refugee program. Um, then I'll share more about the Afghan refugee response and how folks like you guys can get involved. Uh, and then we'll end with Q&A. And this should really only take 10 minutes, so um, I won't be speaking for too long. Great. So now I'll share a quick history of just how our team and our organization came to exist. Um, the, the idea first started back in 2012 um, when a host in New York reached out to Airbnb to ask how she could open her listing for free to help people that were stranded and impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Um, inspired by this host, uh, we launched our disaster response program the next year and then launched officially the Open Homes program um, in 2017 with the goal of housing 100,000 people um, in temporary housing over the next five years. Uh, we kicked this off by a partnership with the International Rescue Committee or the IRC, um, which is one of the big international refugee, refugee resettlement and service organizations worldwide. Um, and uh, we've also done a couple of other things on our team. We launched a donation platform so hosts can donate to support this work. Um, and we launched a frontline stays program last year at the beginning of the pandemic uh, to help provide temporary housing for um, frontline workers um, who are either had to travel or isolate um, to protect their families. Um, and then at the end of 2020, we officially launched Airbnb.org as an independent 501c3 nonprofit. So now um, the Open Homes Program and the Frontline Stays Program are both kind of housed under the Airbnb.org umbrella. So at Airbnb.org, um, our mission is to unlock the power of sharing space, resources, and support in times of need. Um, Airbnb hosts can support uh, Airbnb.org by hosting for free um, or for a discounted rate uh, or by donating. Um, Airbnb.org works with nonprofit organizations globally by providing funding uh, for temporary stays for displaced people um, and also unrestricted grant funding to help support their organizations. Um, and Airbnb and Airbnb.org are legally separate independent entities. Um, as I said, Airbnb.org is a registered 501c3 nonprofit in the US. We have our own leadership structure and our own board of directors that's independent um, from Airbnb. So now I'll share a little bit about the history of our team's work in the refugee space. Um, since 2015, Airbnb and Airbnb.org have housed over 25,000 refugee and asylum seeker guests. Um, our partners have included some key organizations in this space, including a lot of the ones you see here, International Rescue Committee, Highest Church World Service, a bunch of other organizations. Um, and um, the areas where we primarily work have been uh, the US, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. Um, we are now also working in the UK and in Canada um, in partnership with governments there um, through the Afghan refugee response. Um, and our focus areas have included um, things like the Venezuelan refugee crisis, US refugee resettlement, family reunification, um, and now the Afghan refugee crisis. 
So I'll share a little bit about Airbnb.org's response um, to the current humanitarian crisis facing Afghan refugees. So back in August, Airbnb.org made a commitment to provide um, temporary housing to 20,000 Afghan refugee guests. Um, this 20,000 uh, folks, those stays will be fully funded through support from Airbnb, uh, from uh, one of our founders, Brian Chesky, um, and uh, donors to the Airbnb.org uh, refugee fund. And so while Airbnb and Airbnb.org are committed to covering the cost of these stays, um, we are also opening this opportunity up to groups and communities like yours and to the Airbnb host community um, to do things like donate or host for free or host for a discount in order to help stretch that funding um, that we're able to grant our partners and hopefully house even more people um, over that 20,000. Um, Airbnb.org works with nonprofits and sponsorship groups to facilitate these days. Um, so there are partner organizations across um, all of these days uh, and all service fees are waived for refugee stays that are booked through Airbnb.org. So there are three main ways that folks like y'all can get involved um, through Airbnb.org. Um, the first one is I think what we're gonna talk about the most today, which is signing up to host. Um, so, uh, folks can sign up to host for free or for a discounted rate. Um, people that are new to hosting but have the space. Um, so sorry, there's really two ways. So if you are not already an Airbnb host, you can sign up to host exclusively through Airbnb.org, um, which means you would not receive any, um, any requests from vacation bookings or leisure stays or things like that. And you can sign up um, to do that for free. Or if you're an existing Airbnb host, you can opt in your existing listing uh, at a discounted rate or for free as well. Um, the second way that folks can support is donating. If you have an Airbnb account, you can donate. Um, we totally understand that not everyone is in the position or wants to host, um, but for those who can't and wanna help, they can make a one-time donation. Um, or if you're an Airbnb host, you can become a recurring donor as well. Um, all of the donations to Airbnb.org go straight towards connecting people with temporary housing. Um, so none of that funding goes to things like our team or our overhead costs. Um, and the third way is really just to spread the word, which is another thing we're doing here today. Um, you know, the more people we can reach, the more people we can help. So we've been um, encouraging the entire Airbnb community and, and beyond to help widen the, ref uh, the welcome for refugees in this time. So if you haven't hosted a stay like this before, um, or if you're new to hosting at all, I'm sure there's a lot of questions uh, about how it works. So I'll give you a few basics and then be able to answer any more after this presentation. Um, so in regards to time, um, stays can range um, from a few days to a few weeks. We do, um, in 99% of cases, um, do not support stays over 30 days if there are there is a special need. Uh, we'll work with our nonprofit partners to help serve, you know, up to 45 days, but that's not typical. Um, but that said, uh, the average stay length we're saying we're seeing is about seven to 14 days or one to two weeks, uh, obviously depending um, on the area. Um, hosts are able to message with the nonprofit booker and or case manager ahead of the stay. Uh, and make sure all questions and concerns are answered and that the host feels really well prepared to offer a welcoming and restful stay. So um, if you were to sign up and get a request, you would be able to be in direct contact uh, via the Airbnb app with the nonprofit partner um, who's booking the stay, who knows the family and their needs or the individual and their needs. And you could have a dialogue with them um, to make sure that you feel really comfortable with the situation and like your space is right and that you're well prepared. Um, Host the Airbnb.org also have dedicated community support. Um, we have our own specially trained support agents through Airbnb.org that are separate from typical Airbnb support. Um, you would have a direct hotline number and email for that group of folks. Um, they're trained to be trauma informed uh, and they know how to work directly with our nonprofit partners. So they have a lot more context and training than the typical Airbnb support team would um, for this case. Um, Hosts are also protected by all of the insurance and guarantees that cover any typical Airbnb host in this program. 
Um, it's called air cover. So that includes up to $1 million US in damage protection and 1 million uh, US in liability insurance. Um, and there's a link here, airbnb.com slash air cover for more information about that policy. Uh, but that does include everyone who signed up for airbnb.org as well. Um, to offer your place, you need a clean and private space, a comfortable bed and basic amenities and toiletries. Um, I will let the, the experts on this call say more about, about what the biggest need is in Washington, but I would say generally um, across the US, um, it's more likely that folks are looking for entire spaces um, than you know, just a private room. Uh, however, um, if you wanna sign up, that, that you know, obviously doesn't hurt anyone. <laughs> um, if you just have a private space, maybe it's the right space for somebody. But generally, um, we're looking for spaces where families can be together, um, often, often looking for things like kitchens as well. And to end this section, um, you know, one of the biggest questions that I've gotten from hosts who were considering um, becoming a part of this program is, you know, what happens after this day? Um, you know, this individual or this family has been in my space for a couple of weeks, what's next for them? Um, and I would say that our nonprofit partners, um, their mandate is to assist every single guest so that when this stay is over, they'll have their next steps in place. Um, and the case managers to those resettlement organizations um, are responsible for handling that for guests. Um, you know, everything from accessing medical care to education services and permanent housing. So that's not something that as a host, you'd be responsible for through this program. So here's how it works. Um, you would sign up. So as I said, you could either sign up exclusively through airbnb.org to host for free, or um, if you're already an Airbnb host or you are interested in hosting for a discounted rate, you can sign up to be an Airbnb host and opt this space in for airbnb.org um, if you wanted to offer a discounted rate. Um, then you would receive a booking request. Um, and I would also like to note here that, you know, you could sign up and be really excited and then you might not hear from anyone for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, it really, it, you may receive a request in weeks or in months and it's possible you might not receive one at all. It really just depends on the needs um, for refugee stays in your area and the needs of the folks um, that are resettling in your area and if that meets the space. And I will say that can be a disappointing experience, but, um, Honestly, the, it's, the more options that are available through airbnb.org, the more options that folks and families have. Um, and the case managers are really just looking for the perfect space that really suits a family's needs. Um, so it's like great to have more inventory, obviously there. Um, and also the need in your area may continue to evolve over time. I'm sure um, all the other folks that are leading this call can speak to this more than I can, but um, things are a bit hectic um, right now and, um, and needs really do change pretty swiftly. Um, so if you sign up now, you know, it might be a couple of months, but you, you may get that opportunity to host. Um, and then number three, obviously host the stay. So as I said, um, case managers are going to be responsible for the well-being of their clients before, after, and during a stay. Um, that means they'll be responsible for providing for things like food, transportation, access to services, and things like that. Um, I do get asked by hosts if, um, if they'd like to, you know, if they, if they want to welcome their guests with something special, can they do that? Um, that's absolutely something you can do. We definitely recommend you communicate with the, uh, the nonprofit person who booked the stay or their case manager just to understand what's appropriate or if the family has any needs. Um, for example, baby supplies. Um, and then we, we've definitely seen that something as simple as a welcome basket or flowers or a handwritten note can go a really long way to make folks feel more at ease in your space and, and more welcome. Um, here are some of the partners that Airbnb.org is working with in Washington. Um, Lutheran Community Services, International Rescue Committee, World Relief, uh, Episcopal Migration Ministries, and Jewish Family Services. I don't even think I have all of them on the slide. So we're working with quite a few folks in your area. Um, and so what this means is Airbnb.org is granted funding to all of these partners to book stays um, for their clients. 
And that is it from my slide. So we can go into questions um, now. And um, here's the link. I think this will be shared out more if you want to learn a little bit more um, about the program and sign up. You can go to Airbnb.org slash refugees WA. Thank you so much, Katrina. Before we dive right into questions, which we do have several, uh, let's just take a moment to give you a round of a virtual applause. We really appreciate your support and participation. And um, there are several questions in the chat that we're gonna go ahead and dive right into. Some are related to um, refugee resettlement in general and others are related to um, the actual Airbnb process. I'm going to ask you start with the questions related to the Airbnb process, and then I'll answer more of the questions as they pertain to um, to refugee resettlement in general. So one question is, um, I wonder if you could talk about the broader scope for this. Cheryl asks, does this apply to people living in Utah, or is it only for people in Washington State? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are working with partners all over the country. Um, so not just in Washington state, all over the US, I think in all 50 states. Um, so um, I am I can't, don't know the partners we're working with in Utah off the top of my head, but we definitely are. Um, I know that, um, I'm trying to remember, um, but you're definitely able to sign up um, for this program if you're in Utah. Great, thank you so much. Can you explain a little bit about the process? Um, because I think that there's kind of two different initiatives. And uh, one is the pot of funding that has been given to the resettlement agencies. And the other is those, organ those organizations and hosts that can voluntarily give their, their homes for free. And how, how do the actual refugees get connected to, to Airbnb, Airbnb? Yeah, absolutely. So. Basically, like you said, there's kind of two, there's two routes that you can take to host. So if you were just any old Airbnb host hosting for mostly vacation rentals on the platform right now, um, say in Seattle, it, one of our, organiz our refugee organizations who's been our partner organization who's been granted funding um, could actually book uh, some of their clients with that Airbnb host right now um, because of that funding. However, in a in an effort to stretch that funding and to also, um, you know, give folks the opportunity to host if this is something they're called to do. Um, we're also enabling folks to offer a discount or to host for free. And so what that looks like, um, basically how a refugee guest would get connected to you would be always through a nonprofit case manager or a booker. So what that looks like is someone you know, a nonprofit case manager through the International Rescue Committee, for example, um, they know they have a family of four um, and they're looking for a space with three bedrooms in a certain neighborhood in Seattle. So they would go on to Airbnb and they would type in their parameters, just like you would if you were looking for a vacation rental. Um, and uh, then they would search. And um, the way that our nonprofit partners can search, they actually see all of the listings that are listed for zero dollars through airbnb.org or discounted come to the top. So they're able to see those folks that have raised their hand and said, like, I want to do this. This is something I'm passionate about. Um, you know, this is something I want to do. And they've already said yes. So they're, they're able to see that inventory first. Um, which is great for a couple of reasons. It saves uh, their organization money. So they're able to help more people. Um, and it also just shows that um, this is someone who understands the program and who's already said, you know, like, I understand and I want to host an Afghan refugee family or individual, um, which is a big peace of mind for our caseworker partners as well. I hope that helps answer that question. I know it's a little complicated. I think it does. And so uh, essentially the refugees get connected to host homes uh, through the resettlement agencies that are able to make the reservation on the Airbnb special platform. And I think it's important to note that um, the refugee resettlement agencies have been responding to the Afghan humanitarian crisis in this emergency situation. They have received hundreds of thousands of emails and currently here in Washington state, we have five refugee resettlement agencies that resettle and place refugees in eight specific counties. 
So we do have refugee resettlement in Whatcom, Snohomish, King, Pierce counties, as well as Clark, Benton, Franklin, and Spokane counties. And any Airbnb within those communities is welcome to join the resettlement agencies. And I know that they are actually looking for host homes in some of the more remote areas like Whatcom County or um, uh, Clark County or Benton Franklin and Spokane. We know that some counties have been tremendously impacted by flooding and other disasters and uh, COVID as well. And therefore, we totally understand the challenges that those different communities are experiencing, but all hosts are welcome in those areas where we are placing Afghans. Um, our next question, it, I think, is more about the actual hosting. Um, Michelle asks uh, about in the Airbnb hosting site, they've gone into the calendar section and tried to black out certain dates, um, but they've been unable to do so. Can you help in that situation? Yeah, um, I'm, I wish I could see your screen so I could help, but um, I could maybe give you my email and then I could connect you with a support agent um, to help with that problem. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure how helpful I can be in this context, but I would love to connect you with the right people to fix that. Um, uh, just for the everyone else on the call, um, you should be able to black out dates um, on your calendar. If you are already an Airbnb host, um, you cannot specifically black out dates for uh, the refugee program. However, that is something our team is working on building. Um, so if you were to black out dates, um, our, the, our partners and bookers would see those dates blacked out as well, um, unfortunately. However, if you're just an Airbnb.org host, you should be able to black out um, dates on your calendar when you can't host. So um, I will share my email um, in the chat. And so you can email and follow up with me about that. Thank you so much, Katrina. Another question uh, relates to um, the discounts. Sherry asks, I would have offer what type of discounts or may I make our rate? Would damages be reimbursed? And what about the cleaning fees? Great question. So I'll take them one part at a time. Um, so how discounts worked, if you're already an Airbnb host, um, the discounting for Airbnb.org is quite different than what you might be used to um, through the business side. So essentially what you can do through Airbnb.org, if you're already a host um, and you want to opt in your place for a discount, you can go to Airbnb.org slash refugees, WA, click um, the, like, I want a host button, you would select, it would then lead you to a page where you could select your listing that you want to opt in. If you have multiple, all of them will show up and you can select all of them, one of them, however many you want. And then it would, um, it would ask you whether you wanted to open this listing for free or for a discounted rate. If you click discounted rate, then, uh, you would be able to select a flat daily fee. Um, and that's, you know, that would help you understand how much you wanted to cover, how much you wanted to discount, et cetera. Um, we created this functionality because we heard a lot of feedback from hosts that said, you know, I want to host for free, but hosting for free isn't really free. It costs me a lot of money. You know, I have to pay for utilities and water and heat and things like that. So I want to be able to open my space, but I, I can't do it for free. And so we're hoping by offering a simple ability for you to pick a flat rate that can help folks, you know, give how they can, um, understanding that um, not everyone can host for free. Um, and the only rule about the flat rate is it has to be under your typical nightly rate. Um, and then um, for damages, um, as, as I shared earlier, all um, Airbnb.org stays are covered under air cover, which is the host guarantee and insurance. Um, and so what would happen if there were damages at your space is you would um, go through airbnb.org support um, and then they would help you um, become reimbursed for those damages. So that Airbnb would cover those, not you, not the guest, not the organization. Um, and then cleaning fees. So if you are hosting for a discount, um, your, I believe your cleaning fees are still included. Great, thank you so much, Katrina. Um, 
I want to answer, I want to turn and answer some of the questions about general refugee resettlement as well. Um, John and Kim ask a question, how can Afghan refugees only need housing for a couple of weeks and not much longer? Do they really have contacts and options available after a short period of time? Um, we would have thought that they needed to find a community, recover emotionally, find jobs, housing, and much more. So um, the refugee resettlement agencies are looking for emergency housing in order to place people in their local communities. And once they are established, they have a little bit more time to find them permanent housing. Washington State is currently proposed to get about 2,235 people, and we've already welcomed nearly 1,000 of those people. And so we anticipate that we will continue to welcome people through the end of, uh, or through the middle of uh, February and, and beyond. There are currently 34,000 people still residing on military bases that are called safe havens that are welcoming, that are waiting to be welcomed. They are moving at a fast pace. And so over the past 10 weeks, we've welcomed 970 new people into our local communities. And this means that the refugee resettlement agencies don't have the time that it takes to fully place someone in their local communities. However, they are currently working with each individual and family to find them a, uh, a, a house to stay in that is permanent and to connect them with their local community. Most of the people that are currently arriving in Washington state have family members already established in our local communities. This is especially true for our highly impacted area in King County, where about 70 to 75% of all arrivals will be coming in Washington. And so while we are always looking for volunteers to help support with cultural integration and welcoming, uh, which is part of the work that Anila and uh, Navid Hamidi from the Afghan American, or from the Afghan Health Initiative are doing, um, we also currently are immediately needing of just immediate housing, an immediate place for people to stay. And so we're very excited to have um, all of the uh, hosts that are on the call today to participate. At this point in time, I would we will have more time for Katrina to answer questions. And I see that she's busy typing and answering many of the questions in, in the question and answer box as well. Um, but at this point in time, I'd like to welcome Navid Hamidi to the stage. And Navid is going to share with us a little bit about some of the cultural sensitivities that we can be practicing as host homes for Afghan arrivals. Thank you so much for joining us today, Navid, and we welcome your comments and anything that you can do to share with us. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks so much, everybody. And uh, my name is Navid Hamidi. I'm the executive director of Afghan Health Initiative. We're a nonprofit located here in South King County doing our part to help our community as best that we can send uh, culture and linguistically appropriate services for them. So uh, thank you for all the whole families, Airbnb and everybody that's involved in this. It really, this means a lot to our community, to our people in this time of uh, great need. Uh, your services and your help really, really, really matters. And we will never forget it as a community, as an Afghans, that we pride ourselves with our culture and also with our <clears throat> hospitality and uh, uh, being just friendly in general. Uh, I think all cultures are beautiful and there are some <clears throat> beautiful nuance of every culture. There's some sensitivities, regardless of uh, where you're coming from, what religions, uh, what part of the world you're coming from. Everybody has a culture, individual culture, collective culture. <clears throat> so Afghans are uh, not an uh, exception to that uh, uh, idea that we have a beautiful culture. We think everything that we have is uh, uh, built our life, uh, those culture norms, those nuance of cultures lead our life and uh, we cherish it. And uh, it's very, uh, it's very, very uh, uh, there to all of us as an Afghans when we have those prides and we're just really proud of being hospitable, being kind, being a good Muslim, being a good neighbor. And just, just we, we have so much uh, to be proud of. And uh, unfortunately, we are uh, right now in a situation as an 
things that happened in Afghanistan. And now that the, these people are moving, uh, finding themselves with a different culture, mixing with a different culture, the cultural shock is very different. So I think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, great for all of us to learn some nuance of the culture for all of you that if you are interacting with Afghans, Afghan families, uh, uh, it's a great news. Be excited. These people will be your long life friends. They will never forget your help and what you do for them. So I created small like bullet points for myself. I think if it's best to maybe just numbers or bullet point for all of you that see which, uh, uh, like what are some things that just easily you can remember or if you're taking notes. So I think um, I would start something that like clean place to pray. Just Muslims pray five times a day, uh, free of pets. I know a lot of uh, uh, our uh, neighbors here in the U.S. and the West. They have dogs and cats. C cats are fine, but dogs uh, uh, a little bit of a different story. If uh, somebody's cleaning, uh, praying, if uh, the dog is in a different place, and uh, the place that they are uh, praying, if that's uh, free of like dog first, or if it's a shared place, if they are not like. Uh, uh, that that should be a, a, like a separate place for the dog and for the family and to make sure that that dog is not going to uh, that side of the family that they are living. Uh, uh, keeping pets, I think, uh, 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 having it is very normal for all of Afghans, but most of them in Afghanistan, they keep them outside. They love uh, pets, they love animals, but uh, part of their religion is just to, when you pray, you have to keep them like maybe in a, a, a somewhere like uh, separate. Uh, when when praying, a lot of the times when you see five times, it's a lot. I know uh, it's unusual for a lot of people. So uh, when the, she see somebody, if you are uh, talking, have a conversation, it have, has to be a little bit like maybe not too loud, cannot speak uh, close to somebody is that when they are praying and it's not respectful to, to walk in front of uh, somebody when they are praying. Uh, you can just go from the back or you can just wait. If they just turn their face to left and right, then you can pass. Uh, it's not respectful for uh, uh, males uh, to be in the same room when uh, a female, an Afghan female, uh, is uh, praying or is, is, is still in a one room. Uh, it's specifically uh, with Afghan women, they're very shy. That is how uh, it depends where they're coming from as well. And the, within Afghanistan, it's not one type of culture. There are people that they live in big cities. They're uh, 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 more kind of like modern and some peoples that we see in our community that if they are coming from a village or they're very tight with those cultural norms and they're very shy. So. Um, being with uh, uh, one female or your host female or your guest female in one room with a male could uh, just uh, keep them like put them in a situation that fe they feel uncomfortable. Uh, women are very modest, uh, Afghan women, they're Muslim, they always cover being respectful of their privacy, especially of women when she uh, uh, may be slightly uh, uncovered while they're in their house or in their part of the house or not or wearing a scarf. So just uh, when you enter their room or their space knocking that give them time to uh, uh, wear their hijab or their scarf. Uh, if you shout salam alaikum, if you knock, people will just uh, automatically uh, find a few seconds or minutes to make sure that they have their scarves. Uh, uh, mostly uh, males not to be in the same room alone as women. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, that's very important for Afghan men and Afghan women as well, that uh, it's uh, uh, probably will keep them, put them in a situation that they feel awkward and feel uh, very uncomfortable. Uh, about foods and dietary restrictions, a lot of our Muslim community and Afghan community eat halal meat. Uh, fish is fine in terms of like anything that isn't sea, fish uh, is very common, people eat them. No alcohol or uh, uh, also in terms of uh, products uh, that contains animal gelatin, they're saying that it's coming from uh, pig, uh, bone, or whatever that is. So uh, when you give uh, a lot of the kids the candies or cookies, if they contain gelatin, just uh, it's uh, good to know that, okay, that is in restrictions. Uh, so as I mentioned, fresh is always okay. Uh, uh, Afghans are very, uh, uh, like, as I mentioned, for hospitables, when you go to their place, they always offer tea, green or black tea, uh, for a lot of dry fruits uh, with the tea, uh, like nuts or like uh, raisins. And a lot of, if they are connected already to Afghan stores, they will have a lot of uh, uh, dry fruits. So it's uh, 
it's always a good bonding moment with the family to just uh, have a sip of tea uh, and uh, have a chit chat. Uh, females, I think, uh, usually uh, don't shake hands. And it's very important. I noticed that when you go to a lot of academics environments and hosp uh, like hospitals or uh, colleges, uh, uh, when you see a, Afghan, uh, or a Muslim female in general, if there's a handshake, there's an awkward moment that somebody is putting their hands on their chest and also they're just uh, doing this or they're just putting their hands on their chest and they're not shaking hands. So to prevent that awkward uh, interactions, the, everybody, all parties uh, feel uh, very comfortable. It's a great, uh, I think it's uh, nice to know this that uh, Afghan females usually don't shake hands. Afghan females, uh, males shouldn't shake hands too but it's personal preference it's uh, this is a cultural norm that it differs from individual to individual but in law as law and in, in the majority of afghan women's and males don't shake uh, females and males hand a uh, female men's and females uh, 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 what else <clears throat> i think uh, uh, these are the things that is very basic and important for our culture. Uh, I think Afghans are very respectful and very considerate, uh, rich in culture and good food. So it's uh, a great opportunity for you all if you're hosting. Uh, 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 it's a great experience, uh, something very unique. Uh, I believe that Afghan culture is very unique and very rich. So you all have a great opportunity to just experience this either in your own home or in your neighborhood, your community, and you and you are involved in uh, hosting these families. So uh, good for you, uh, all you guys. And uh, uh, I would love to, uh, I don't know if I meant, uh, missed anything. I'm sure I missed a lot of things, but these were the, I think, coming to my mind and also uh, very important facts facts about our cultures and other cultures. And if anybody have a question, so, uh, you can put them in chat. I can answer them to, from there as well and there as well. And feel free to put my email address if you uh, are unsure of a situation. So I would love to just send you a quick uh, text or uh, email. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us, Navid. I think it's I think it's really helpful. And for many of our our guests, um, we can tell from the questions in the in the question and answer boxes, as well as just you know our general um, Washington culture that people do want to be respectful of of the Afghan culture. And so I think the tips, I think, will be really very helpful. One of the things that we have heard from refugee resettlement agencies is their preference is to have separate um, spaces. And so a full, complete space that is separate from uh, the hosting family. And so uh, not necessarily an ideal situation would just be one room where you would have two beds or one room where you would have limited space, but really having a separate place so that people can can have their space as well. And in that case, I think if the family did have a dog or a pet in their own space, it would probably be acceptable. But I, I think that is, I think that is a very different perspective. I just want to say thank you so much, Navid, and please feel free. Uh, we hope that you're able to stay with us as we continue uh, to have our conversation. And, and learn a little bit more about what people want to, to gain. One of the questions that did appear in the chat is about uh, COVID-19 vaccines. All of the Afghan arrivals are being uh, receiving medical screenings at the uh, safe haven military bases, and all of them are being offered um, vac COVID-19 vaccines. We have learned recently from our health clinics here in Washington state that the vast majority of people arriving here in Washington have already received both doses of their COVID-19 vaccine and have documentation to that effect as well. Um, we are really excited also to welcome Karen Nelson. Karen has been hosting uh, through Airbnb a, an Afghan family. I don't know, Karen, we're excited to welcome you. I know that you were uh, busy, so I'm not sure if you're able to unmute and join us at this point in time. Hi, I am. I'm in my car, so I'm going to maybe not turn my video on because <laughs> I'm, I'm in between things. Um, so yeah, I am currently, my family is currently hosting a family of five. Um, 
And I can definitely speak to a couple of the questions that just came up. Um, I just responded to somebody about the indoor dog. We have two dogs and um, we just keep them upstairs and our guests. Um, so our Airbnb is in our downstairs part of our house. And it, um, they have two bedrooms and a bathroom that's private to them. And then our kitchenette is kind of in a common that they use as in a common area, but um, we aren't down there we're probably down there almost every day but not more than like 10 minutes unless it's just to chat with them um and they've been um it, it seems like it's working out fine for them um and the dogs as long as the dogs stay upstairs it's become kind of a joke that the um our dogs are very curious about them um but to, so they the um the kids like to laugh and look at the dogs. Um, but just overall, I have to say it has been an absolutely fabulous experience for us. And we are um, so excited about being able to, um, to offer this, uh, to offer this, our space to the family and also just to have the opportunity to meet and meet them and, and have this really lovely cultural exchange. And I'm, it, it's exciting for us that they're in our home um, rather than in an Airbnb space that we don't live in. So that's been really fun for us. Thank you so much, Karen. First of all, thank you so much uh, to, um, to your service and for opening your home. Uh, we welcome all questions to Karen and just also just for your taking the opportunity uh, to share with us. I would also like to give Anila an opportunity to speak about Afghan culture as an Afghan American herself. I'm sure that she'll have some, some things to add as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. And hello again, everybody. Uh, I think Navi did a great job setting sort of the framework for a lot of the conversation around cultural understanding and some specific areas of sensitivity and highlighting certain points. Uh, I want to especially emphasize the hospitality, which is really big for Afghans, uh, the pride, uh, and also the, the sense of loyalty. Uh, as, as Navid said, like the, the Afghans, especially anybody that you have sort of in your home or near your home, uh, they will probably become lifelong friends. And I think a testament to this is the fact that so many of our veterans are now working uh, day and night uh, to help save the Afghans who they made relationships with through the, the 20 years that we were in Afghanistan uh, because of the loyalty and the tight bond and relationships there. So I think any of you who will be serving as host homes uh, will hopefully get that opportunity as well to build those beautiful relationships and the kind that Karen, uh, it sounds like, has been experiencing so very happy to hear about that. I do want to just mention a few things. Uh, number one is uh, Navid referred to this, and that is sort of a little bit of diversity. You know, uh, there's certainly generalities that we can share uh, about what may be true for the majority of folks, or you know, for folks from this part of the the part of Afghanistan versus other parts of Afghanistan. We can share some of those generalities, but it's always important to have that direct communication because there is so much diversity. And I will actually say that Afghanistan is actually, uh, in my mind the most, if not the most uh, diverse place in the world, both in terms of how people look. Uh, some people have a certain vision of, of who an Afghan looks like, and then they get shocked and surprised when they see a blonde, blue-eyed uh, person from Afghanistan or somebody that totally looks like they belong to, to some other part of the, the world, uh, being an Afghan child or all of this. So there's a lot, a lot of richness in that uh, there's also diversity in languages, uh, diversity in religious practices and religion itself. Uh, while the majority is certainly Muslim, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the Afghans that you will be coming across will be Muslim. And even if you do have folks that are Muslim, the religious practice may differ in terms of sort of uh, Shiite or Sunni, and then also just level of practice. There are many Christians in, in our country, and the levels of practice or commitment to the faith or the faith practices uh, vary tremendously. 
tremendously. And that may be true for some of the Afghans who will be staying with you as well. Uh, and so, so that's, again, just emphasizing the importance of communication. Um, I will also say that cultural and familial ties are so important to Afghans. Uh, and of course, they will probably make relationships with you sort of, and consider you family. Uh, but family and culture is really important. So especially if there are Afghans in places where there isn't much other community or family with them, uh, that becomes a real challenge. So if there are uh, folks that you're hosting in more sort of places, you know, more places where there might not otherwise be a large Afghan American community, uh, please do try to engage them with some of the other resources that may be available, Afghan American organizations, uh, reach out to me, reach out to Navid, reach out to others so that we could connect these folks so they don't feel isolated uh, because Afghans uh, generally come from a very strong communal kind of uh, uh, culture rather than a very individual culture. So it is a bit of a culture shock if they are isolated or alone or individual in that sense. So, so please keep that in mind. I'll also say that food is very, very important to Afghans. It is used to show love. It is used, you know, like they will want to feed you. Uh, any, any, anybody that I know that has interacted with Afghans uh, and they get the opportunity, they're always overfed uh, and they will keep pushing food on you. So, so know that about some sort of Afghan culture. And also food sharing is very important. People like sharing their food. Uh, and I know often, um, you know, uh, uh, we in American culture, we also like sharing food, but not always maybe in the same way, like here off of my plate, I'm going to put it onto your plate kind of thing. So just keep that in mind for, for food sharing purposes. Uh, and that speaks actually more broadly to the issue of privacy and space. Um, of course, Afghans want their, their own privacy, just like we all do, but uh, they have a different, uh, again, generally speaking, uh, Afghan culture has a little bit more uh, intrusiveness, if, if you want to call it that, uh, because everybody kind of is in, in each other's business at times. Uh, uh, Afghans like to, they care about their, each other and they see each other as family and as part of them. So you may get asked questions or, you know, like, are you married? Why aren't you married? Let me let me connect you to somebody or things, questions like that, especially if you're a single woman. Uh, and so, so that's something to just be aware of. It's out of love. It's out of uh, desire to really consider you as part of their family. Uh, there might be a little bit more sort of uh, engagement of like, you know, being close to each other, uh, while they, for some it might be uh, uh, divided by gender, there is still that very strong bond and connection, uh, and people might sort of, uh, within their gender, hug more or touch each other more, and if you're not comfortable with that, again, just communicate that. I think communication is really the key here. Um, and the final point that I'll just mention is uh, there is, again, in Afghan culture generally, not everybody, but there is a, a, a sort of a respect for authority and a little bit more formality than we sometimes have in American culture. Um, this includes things like people standing up when somebody of authority sort of walks in sometimes. This is done in classrooms. This is done with teachers. This is done with, with a lot. So there is potentially a higher level of formality at some times or uh, sort of respect shown uh, to people in positions of authority. Uh, so just keep that in mind too in case it comes up in any way. Uh, but bottom line, I, I think this can be a great way to learn about different cultures and really to help challenge ourselves and grow uh, through the process as well. So I, I hope and, and pray that everybody has a fantastic experience with that. Uh, and hopefully, again, you can reach out to some of the Afghan American organizations here locally to help in case there are ever any issues or questions or additional support or cultural training or anything else like that. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Anila. And I do see that Navid has also rejoined us. There is one question in uh, that we received that I would like maybe to have um, uh, either uh, Anila or both uh, Anila and Navid answer. Um, and the question comes from Keen, and um, it seems like uh, Keen is offering one room with its dedicated bathroom, but a shared living and kitchen space. Is it okay if we cook have cooked pork in the kitchen? We will not cook pork while the guests are with us. I think that's a, a you know a very specific question about wanting to to be culturally respectful. And so I wonder if maybe um, Navid or Anila, you would like to answer that question. Uh, Go ahead, Navid. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm an Afghan born and raised in Afghanistan. I recently moved to the U.S. Been eight years. I think. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. I would not. I would personally uh, not feel comfortable if uh, there was pork uh, cooked uh, 
in the same area and I'm cooking, I'd be really comfortable. And also this is, again, it's a personal preference to a lot of individuals. Some families should probably will be okay, but majority of people will be really uncomfortable and will not be happy in that situation. Yeah, I, I would sorry. just add that. Oh, go ahead, Navi. Sorry, but like I want to just sometimes it's like uh, you want to be con like conscious of somebody's uh, culture. And also I want to make sure that when I provide those steps and I, I want to be respectful of the space and people's uh, uh, like house and uh, their kitchens and that is their space and they are hosting and there should be like a compromise. But it is really hard. Some families that I know in this new wave of Afghans, their mentality and their how strong they're uh, like holding those cultural norms and how sensitive they are specifically when it comes to something that is not connected to culture but religion. In this case, it's a, mostly it's religion because uh, it's pork is prohibited in Islam and a lot of the time even just touching it and look at it and uh, being in the same environment as it is kind of like uh, uh, not acceptable to them. And I would, I would just add that I certainly agree that that would be the case for probably the majority of folks. They would really not feel comfortable with having sort of the, the same place that that pork is being cooked uh, and the smell sort of is infiltrating sort of the, the whole place. Uh, I will again, though, emphasize that I think it's important to, to communicate that. And for some, it may be okay. And also it depends, I think, on how uh, sort of the cleaning practices between cooking or how often uh, the, there's crossover in the cooking uh, and how often sort of how often that occurs. So if they're completely different schedules, different times, and it's thoroughly clean between, uh, then I think it will be less of a problem. Uh, but it's just something that I think is important to communicate and understand, as, as Navid said, that there's just that uh, not only the cultural issues around it, but then the specific religious prohibition against pork. Uh, so that makes it really something that would be um, something that would be difficult for a lot of the Afghan arrivals. Thank you so much for all of your questions. And I see that Katrina has been busy typing away to answer all of the questions about Airbnb. I am gonna call Katrina back to the stage at this point in time. And uh, just wonder, is there anything that you would like to elevate for the conversation or any additional questions at this time that you think would be important for our listeners and our guests to better understand. And now is also a great time for anyone to ask any uh, additional questions or make any additional comments um, at, at this time. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I think I would just say, um, and this is something I think I said a couple of times in the question and answer box, but, um, you know, I would err on the side of not making any assumptions about people. And if you want to host and you're interested in hosting the case managers and the nonprofits that are working with, um, with their clients um, are in communication with them, know their needs, have a really good idea of their background, what they're comfortable with, what they're not. And so I would just say, um, you know, that's a great resource if you do want to host and you want to understand how to provide um, a culturally sensitive and welcoming stay. Um, that's really what those folks are there to help you do. Um, and so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't take yourself out of being able to host. Um, I would just say, you know, the communication there is really key. Great. Thank you so much, Katrina. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of other additional questions. There is one that I would like to raise that is this more specific to resettlement, and it comes from Watan, who talks about welcoming her own family to Washington State, brothers, sisters, cousins, and some close relatives. And one of the things that I think is important to note is that um, Washington State specifically King County, is considered a highly impacted area. And because of this, we are um, the International Organization for Migration and the Department of State is really restricting the number of people who can come to Washington to those people who have immediate family relatives. 
Washington State and the Department of Social and Health Services is currently working with our resettlement agencies and our other local community partners to expand our capacity to potentially welcome more people. We understand that many people have voluntarily left uh, after the, the safe haven military bases and have come to Washington. And we know that many more people, the people that Watan is referring to, her brothers, her cousins, and others who may not have immediate family members here, um, that want to come and may eventually come uh, through what we call secondary migration. It is our hope that we will be able to work with everyone to expand our capacity. And one of our efforts is to recruit additional hosts through Airbnb to make this a platform that we can use uh, in continuing in December, January, and uh, potentially through March and April as more Afghans arrive. So you you as hosts could potentially play a really significant role in continuing to expand our state's ability to welcome more people. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna say that um, we will be sharing all of our contact information in the chat uh, for anyone who is interested. And I think Katrina probably already has and will definitely uh, put her, her information in the chat as well. I will also share mine. You can always reach out to me. And if there are not any further questions or conversations, we can go ahead um, and close for the evening. Um, I would welcome any uh, opportunities to answer additional questions via email. This presentation and webinar has been recorded and it will be posted on our DSHS website for anyone who is interested in serving as a host for Afghan refugees and through our partnership with Airbnb.org. I want to give a huge thanks to Katrina, Anila, Karen, and Navid for joining us this evening and for um, all of your work in really making Washington a welcoming place and continuing to open up our, our doors to our newest Afghan neighbors. I'd also like to thank uh, Gol Siddiqui, who is a, a volunteer with DSHS that has done a lot of outreach and support to make tonight's event possible. Thank you so much for all that you do. We could not do this without all of the support of um, all of our our partners in, in um, the audience, as well as our partner panelists tonight. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.